In his time at the Sword Mastery Academy in Underworld, Kirito fostered a garden, the Sevilla flowers within being something he couldn't help but connect to himself and his circumstances. From outside of the region, through care and aid from others, they were capable of finding root here. As a human from a time and culture far different from those of Underworld, it was because he wasn't alone in this world that he was able to live there. But this is hardly the only time plant life occurs as a symbol in Alicization. After all, Underworld itself is something of a garden. The artificial fluctuates sown as seeds in hopes of bearing the fruit that was true artificial intelligence. A virtual life with mental capabilities on par with the real. Kirito started his garden as an experiment before coming to connect to it, seeing himself in the plant life, much like the Underworld began as an experiment. Kirito's time there is part of an effort in scientific discovery and eventual utilization of the artificial fluctuates as labor and weapons until he truly lived among them and came to understand the humanity there. But a garden is a fragile thing, as Kirito came to discover. The fruits of his own efforts were reduced to nothing by Ryos and Humbert. Seeing no value in the garden, they simply destroyed it, negligent of the life that was being fostered. Born as nobles, granted power and status by the systems at large, they saw those below them as no fundamentally different than Kikuoka saw those of Underworld, as potential tools to be used. With their power, they abused those underneath them as they saw fit. But a system is only so powerful. Code 871 was yet another limitation placed on those of Underworld. An act of sabotage from above, the code was intended to slow the development of the true AI, and, though successful, its implementation also acted as a filter. Well in line with the ideology of Sword Art Online, where human spirit can go beyond systems in place, this conflict takes on another layer in regards to artificial floodlights. Existences that are not inherently seen as human. Yet by breaking code 871, Yu-Gi-Oh shattered the systems in place, both the code and the laws of Underworld, determining that those controlling systems weren't worth as much as the safety of his pupil and comrades. And of course, behind that choice was a simple emotion, one that would continue to define the conflict throughout Alicization, love. For that love, Yu-Gi-Oh would do anything it could, that feeling allowing him to take action and that emotion was nowhere to be found in Ryos and Humbert. Valuing other lives little, even their own bond was a tenuous one. Bleeding to death from Yu-Gi-Oh's sword, Ryos demanded Humbert use the rope binding his wound and keeping him alive to save Ryos instead. Concerned with his own self-preservation, Humbert denied him, valuing his own safety above Ryos's. This left Ryos trapped in a paradox. As a noble, he upheld systems and hierarchies that benefited him, Preserving his own life would mean threatening another, any acts leading to death being a violation of the taboo, and thus removing him from those systems he benefited from. Trapped between his desire to preserve his own life, and his desire to uphold the rules keeping him from doing so, his mind broke down. The boy with no love or care for any but himself unable to reconcile the dilemma, succumbing to the codes that restrained him. And it's that word, desire, that stands at odds with love. A weaker feeling, but similar enough to be confused, it is through desire that Underworld became something other than the Garden of Life it was meant to be. Though love was needed for the AI to truly reach human capacity, Code 871 was injected by a plant, part of an outside group that was prepared to destroy Underworld and take its gains for money. Yanai had no feelings towards any in Underworld except a desire for Canela. Yet that desire was not so different from Kikuoka's initial desire, similarly not seeing the inhabitants of Underworld or artificial fluctuates as people. Displaying the nature of artificial fluctuates to Asuna, he reproduced a copy of Higa, which could not reconcile his artificial nature and was destroyed. Knowing that a being that perceived itself as being alive would be destroyed once its nature was known to it, he allowed for the creation of that life before enacting the course of action that would lead to its death without even blinking. It wasn't real. It wasn't flesh and blood. That same logic was exactly what Yanai and Kikuoka shared. As those of Overworld were inherently above those lower lives, they were inherently less valuable. And within Underworld, there was another who shared that very same mindset, ruling above it all. Much like Kikuoka, Canela also operated through rather scientific means, that diligence allowing her to find the system commands that she could use to prolong her life while her experiments gave her the power to control Underworld. In tandem with Code 871, she assisted in reducing the potential humanity of Underworld, allowing her to easily reign above as something of a god. Only having desires for herself, only seeing herself as a being, in matching Kikuoka, she revealed how unsettling his mindset was when in a direct position to affect the inhabitants of Underworld. Like he toyed with the artificial fluctuates of his comrade, 
Canela manipulated countless entities in experiments to further the knowledge of the world, easily sacrificing those beneath her, even though they were the same kind of artificial fluctlight as her. Her ascendance was merely the result of her luck and skill, yet for that, she saw fit to reign above everyone, even seeing herself as above those in Overworld. When Kirito threatened the possibility of outside action, Canela chided him, asking if those of Overworld constantly prayed to a higher power so that they would not be destroyed. Though her actions only placed herself above others arbitrarily, in refusing to bow to the outside world, she evokes a similar sentiment as Alice does when she stands on Overworld and meets the people there. As, if simulated realities are possible, then it stands to reason that most realities are in fact simulated, the likelihood of a recognized one being the original reality abysmally low. As such, Alice approaches the Doma with an even hand. Familiar with Canela's tyranny, she remarked that if the humans in front of her were opposed by ones from an overworld even further above, full of those who would want to use them as slaves, then they too would fight as Alice was prepared to if need be. Though they stated similar beliefs, their basis of reasoning couldn't be more different. Alice came to live among the overworlders in hopes of connecting with them, understanding them, and in turn allowing them to come to connect with and understand her. Not as beings on a hierarchy of worlds, but beings all the same. Yet, though she reigned as a god, Canela was neither divine nor an existence that offered love, for she did not believe in it. To her, desire and love were one and the same. In her eyes, the love that pushed Yu-Gi-Oh to break Code 871, and the desire Ryos and Humbert felt when forcing themselves on TSA and Ranier were no different. It was a simple conflict of desire and nothing more. As such, when Yu-Gi-Oh found his way to her, prepared to take her life, she was capable of twisting him to her ends. Describing him as a flower withering away in a pot, she insists no one has loved him. No one has desired him and him alone. Kirito's friendship was something also offered to Alice, and Alice Zuberg's given to both him and Yu-Gi-Oh. His mother's love was split between his brothers, but Canela would only love him. The pain of realizing he'd experienced no love meant for him made it easy for him to give up his identity, so as to feel no more pain, only Canela's love. Having experienced both the love of a human and Canela's desire, Yu-Gi-Oh was capable of defeating Kirito and Alice like no Integrity Knight before them, yet it was exactly for that experience that Canela's ideals were proven wrong. After Yu-Gi-Oh's victory, she aimed to redo her control, allowing Yu-Gi-Oh to experience the memories and feelings that had been lost. Though they had hurt him before, pushing him to undergo the synthesis ritual of his own volition, now, though he had known that pain, after feeling that same love again, even if it wasn't exclusively for him, it reminded him that not having that love, just Canela's desires, hurt even more. Alice states that pain is a reminder of her humanity, Canela's abuse of that love and pain serving as a further example of her lack of humanity, as she tried to avoid all pain and suffering herself. Though love and pain are part of being human, so is the inevitability of death, that which Canela feared in her inability to totally control Underworld. Among the casualties in the battle against Canela was Yu-Gi-Oh. Combining with Blue Rose, Yu-Gi-Oh and Kirito's bond directly challenged Canela's statement. If she believed that love offered to multiple people wasn't true love, then Kirito, possessing so many bonds with others, feeling pain in his own way for those he'd lost, would have never been able to unite with Yu-Gi-Oh like he did. Just as no two people are the same, no two loves offered can be identical. Kirito may have failed to protect Yu-Gi-Oh, but their heart and will remain bound together by love. Kirito able to move forward to protect all of Underworld. Canela proved her lack of humanity, trapped by her reliance on the systems that gave her power. Making herself immune to metal, she believed no weapon could harm her, only for Kirito's blade of wood and Yu-Gi-Oh's blade of ice and blood to subvert her systems. Nature and humanity surpassing Canela where cold technology couldn't. In her escape, she too met the endpoint of her own ideals. Having goaded Chidoken on with his empty desire for her body, she was destroyed by that same desire she manipulated. Love is not meant to be received, and thus desired, but given, offered because it is there. Canela might have posited that love did not exist, but she couldn't have been more wrong, as even within her integrity nights, those whose humanity she nullified, turning those who'd broken her laws into her tools, there was so much love to be found. Bercoli loved Alice like his daughter, sacrificing himself to take down the one who threatened her. Among those of the Axiom Church, Shato was much like the flower that became her weapon, isolated and alone. Only capable of cutting, she kept others at bay for fear of hurting them. 
until she found a connection through battle, finally coming to find the one she didn't want to cut among her enemies. Loving Alice, Eldry was capable of fighting beyond the limits of his own endurance if it meant protecting her and their allies. And that love was not exclusive to those of Underworld. Threatened by the outside, the virtual space of Underworld had allies. If the artificial fluctlights would be marginalized by Overworld humans for not having flesh and blood, for not being real, then those who seemed to live in the virtual might have just been that much closer to understanding them. Appealing to VR MMO players, Lizbeth knew that the bonds they made in those virtual spaces were real, even if they were just as intangible as an artificial fluctlight. Their experiences and struggles had set the stage for the scientific advances happening now, the literal seed of VR MMO being threatened by those who did not care for the virtual. <laughs> Those VR MMO players had already known how human the artificial fluctites were, without even having met them. And so, for the sake of the bonds they had and the ones they had yet to make, they joined in on the War of Underworld. Emblematic of these VR MMO players, ones who came to love and enjoy the virtual without having experienced SAO, Zugaha entered Underworld, and shortly after was attacked her blood producing rapid growth of foliage, the dark wastes now seeing green because of the pain of another being like many of those inhabiting those wastes, one who so easily saw Lil as a being where even his own allies simply called him an animal, those of the outer wastes used to living and serving as tools to those above them rather than recognized as the beings they were, Sukaha's simple kindness enough to push Lil to defend her, the plant life she formed no longer coming from her pain at the hands of those killing for their own benefit and wilting away, but growing because of her strength that she was able to regain from the connection she'd made. But the invitation of the Overworlders into the war did not only extend to those bearing love. At the behest of the mercenary group attacking the Ocean Turtle, human players unaware of and disregarding the reality of the Underworld treated it as just a game, further being manipulated by Masago, a human product of the same kind of racial, geographical, and political divisions that separated the two warring sides of the Underworld the virtual landscape becoming a battleground for the struggles of the overworld. Without knowledge, without connections, they were led to hate the perceived cheating Japanese players. Used in his own life as an object for the desires of others, Vasago was left only with his hatred. Even his claimed love for Kirito was a desire to see him corrupted and fall, hating that the boy could face down so many broken, vile people without becoming vile himself, like Vasago had been twisted into his shape by the world around him. But though Visago tried to corrupt the unwitting invaders in the same way, they were subverted by the actions of another who did change. But rather than fall like Visago did, and wanted Kirito to do, Eiji had instead grown because of Kirito. As he battled to protect Underworld, familiar lyrics from Longing play. This new context for the song matched with Yuna urging the invaders to fly on their own wings, dispelling Visago's suggestive powers. Interestingly, as Visago battles with Eiji, Another verse of the song is played, one from the full version of the song that did not play in the runtime of Ordinal Scale. In the context of Ordinal Scale, and my prior reading, that new world may have referred to Einkrad, if not for the fact that the song was sung for those trying to return to the old world. But this specific verse being used here offers a new reading to the lyrics, with the new world instead being the frontier of Underworld, beyond even full dive MMOs the song that exposes the miracle being that of Aegis. After his loss to Kirito, he came to accept his past as Nautilus, finding the strength to move forward on his own power, buying even just a little more time for Kirito. For his ability to love his past self, capable of receiving Yuna's love, even able to love his time in the horrid death game that was SAO, the miracle his song achieved was small, but key, as Kirito was still burdened by the mistakes and failures in his own past. Racked with guilt, Kirito had always been someone who struggled to connect with others for his difficulty in accepting himself. Taking the label of beater, he accepted his wrongdoing, even if it was just the guilt of letting someone die in front of him. Burdened with loss after loss, unable to see himself from any perspective but his own, his soul gradually drove itself to suicide in his empty shell. But that was only the Kirito he knew, one who'd failed and let others down time and time again. Reducing himself to his worst, he neglected so many other perspectives. He could be a dorky, awkward loser, but when the chips were down he possessed a reliability that Asuna could always trust in. Even though he was generally reclusive and obsessed with games, he'd still found the courage to connect with others he'd remained distant from before, like Sugaha. Struggling with weakness and trauma, even burdened by those he'd killed, the strength he'd managed to find was known by no one better than Sinon, 
And in Underworld, though he was flaky and emotional, it was Kirito who wielded a sword and showed others how to cut their own path through fate, Yujiro being granted freedom from his calling thanks to his dear friend. Though separated from those who loved him, those bonds, those links were still there, and they would never fade as long as he treasured them. Bearing so much love, Kirito returned to the fray to oppose those besieging Underworld. Defeating the enemy players without hurting them, he exposed their lack of hatred. Though misguided, they had merely been there to enjoy themselves like Kirito and friends had been in Alfheim and Gungale, the Sago no longer able to control them. Powerless without hatred, Kirito did not strike him down, instead making him a real part of the virtual world he did not care for, the Prince of Hell becoming a demon tree. If the Sago was driven by the inverse extreme of love that was hatred, and Canela the twisted, shallow love that was desire, then Gabriel Miller was evocative of the antithesis of love, indifference. Fascinated by the soul, he didn't even see the artificial fluctlights as different from humans, merely being curious about what souls they might possess. To him, that core spirit of humanity was nothing more than an object of interest. Sociopathic, unable to understand others, by killing them he tried to get closer to them and understand them through seeing their raw souls. Defined by killing, those motivated by hatred would find their blades broken. Through their hatred he fought that which he already understood possessing the will and capability to kill since he was a child, acting much like those possessed with hate even though he felt none, and Gabriel could only be defeated by that which he did not understand. Kirito, though young and burdened with everything he knows about himself, understands himself well, never shying from the real person he is. Though he struggled to understand others, that he tried at all separated him from Gabriel, and through that honesty he was loved by others, and bearing that love, he fought for Underworld. That place that had been his home for the last two years of his life may have been virtual, but his love for it was real. As Underworld closed in on its fate, Kirito bathed it in darkness, placing Underworld under a night sky, the darkness before the dawn. And once again, we return to the garden. With the Zavilia flowers representing Kirito, the other flowers that restored them to life had wanted to save them, much like Kirito himself was restored by the feelings of those who wanted to save him. But while that is one potential reading, by seeing the flowers as the natural inhabitants of Underworld, and the Sophilia as Kirito, accepted as one of Underworld despite being an outsider, Kirito would bear all those feelings. For the night sky was filled with stars, each one holding the hopes and feelings of those in Underworld, inhabitants or otherwise, praying for the safety of the world they loved and those within it. It was because Kirito wasn't alone in either world that he could defend everything. Everyone's color found itself in Kirito's sky, his blade filled not with hatred at the one who threatened Underworld, but matching the feelings of those who lived in this world that was very real, Gabriel unable to stand up against that which he could not comprehend. Following the War of Underworld, those who fought would come to see the dawn, followed by something of a new day. The real world changed forever by the space of the virtual, as more connections, more links, became possible. Once again, I would like to thank my patrons, Thanks Naturad, Muhammad Akim, Bro Rike, Kurosawa, Tangoon, Sam Bellmeyer, Offline But Not, Bayonort, Justice Man, Flarboo, Brian Nesseth, and Dojo32161. Thank you for watching.